Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. We have a nice full screen. It's it's so um, such a pleasure to see so many faces and some um, that haven't I haven't seen in quite a long time. So welcome everybody. Um, this is our Teaching Tuesdays um, series, which um, a little bit of teaching and some socializing and whatever else. So um, this is the fourth, I think, um, program that we've had. Um, and um, very, um, we're very lucky to have um, our congregant, Alicia Babstein, who is um, one of the archivists at the um, Oregon Jewish Museum Center for Holocaust Education. And she's gonna be presenting, as you all know, on the Beth Israel um, archive. I'm gonna let her do a little bit more of introduction um, um, of herself and of the archive, but I just wanna make um, mention that we have um, several um, people with us today that worked on that archive. So there were lots of uh, volunteers from the congregation and um, one who's not with us is not on the screen today is Rose Rustin. Um, but we have Shirley Rackner who worked on it, Alice Meyer, Carol Chesler, Gerald Blauer, um, other people. I think that's maybe Sue Friedman's um, screen. We don't see her picture, but I think that's her. Um, Evelyn Maisels also was working on it and Sharon Tarlow was a volunteer. And um, from the people who um, I chatted with about this program, they told me that Pierce, um, mm -hmm. who everybody knows, I think most yeah. people know, um, also did a lot of legwork um, in helping to assemble the materials for the archive. So uh, with that background, I am going to, with pleasure, turn it over to Alicia. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Sally. Um, one other person uh, was actually Sally's mom, Eve, has also oh. worked uh, extensively. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, as Sally mentioned, I'm the archivist here at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I know many of you from either services or, um, as she mentioned, those of you who have worked with us here on the collection over the years um, and on other projects. Um, so today uh, I wanna share a little bit from the, like I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history of CBI. I know that's not what you're here for, so I won't make it overly lengthy, mm -hmm. um, but I wanna show you the objects from part of the CBI collection as I sort of walk through that history. I think it's the most interesting way to do that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what we do here, what's in the archives, how we collect what we collect, um, share a little bit about the status of the CBI collection and then open it up for questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and dive right in unless anyone has any questions or concerns here right off the bat. Um, biggest one, can everyone hear me okay? Just thumbs up or perfect. Okay. Um, okay. So let me share my screen real quick. That's going to be the most important part. Well, not the most important part, but it's going to make things a lot more fun for you guys. Uh, let's see. All right. Can everyone, uh, I know I can't see everybody now, but this everyone can see the screen, I hope. If you can't, please go ahead and drop it in the chat and I'll, I'll see if I can correct it. Um, if you have any comments, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Questions you can put in the chat or the, um, actually, I guess the chat's probably all we have. Where, this isn't a webinar, excuse me. So questions, comments, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on it as we go along. Um, Chelsea can maybe also, and, and she can ping me. Uh, if there's a place I need to stop. If you also just want to say something or interject at any point, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and talk over me. That's fine. I'll stop. Um, any questions along the way, any concerns? Uh, and if you know something that I don't, uh, please also drop that in the chat. Um, that can be really useful. And that's how we get all the information here at the, at the museum. Um, so we will move right on. 
So a lot of the early information um, that we have about the congregation comes from uh, 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 many, many sources. Uh, and one of those sources is what you see here. This is the front cover of the Golden Book. Um, so the Golden Book is, uh, it contains a lot of early information about, uh, it's foundational information primarily about the um, congregation. So this includes major dates um, of events, uh, names and signatures of people um, who were present at synagogue events, um, such as installations and dedications. Uh, Golden Books, this one included, often also serve as a ledger. So they provide a list of, you know, founders, early officers, original membership, contributors to various funds, um, etc. Uh, here you can see on the left, uh, I hope it's on your left, it's the opening page to this golden book and you can see um, Solomon Hirsch's signature there and David Solis Cohn. So they were early members and founders of the synagogue and it's really something to see their actual signatures. Uh, I think it's really quite stunning. Um, the pages of this book are quite thick uh, and you can see in this slide here, again, um, if you can see behind me, I've got some of these objects out. So the golden book is directly behind my, my shoulder here. Um, but it's a little hard to show on a screen. So I have some of these photos here in a slideshow and you can see the gold leaf on the edge of the pages. It's really a gorgeous book and it's in really good shape also. Um, so the first meeting of the congregation um, or rather the uh, community at the time who was interested in creating a congregation uh, was attended by eight men uh, and it took place on May 2nd, 1858 uh, here in Portland at the National Hotel. Uh, so at this meeting, they discussed uh, the creation of a synagogue and called a second meeting for May 9th. I'm not actually sure why they called that second meeting. I think they might have wanted a few more people to join. Um, and they did get four more members who joined the meeting at that time. Uh, they adopted a constitution, they elected officers, and about two months later on July 4th, 1858, they were officially organized as a congregation with 21 male members. That's always uh, something we find in the these kinds of records early on is um, it was they don't mention women. There are no women's names present in any of these documents. So they don't have to explicitly tell us that they were only male member congregations at the time, but we can tell that that's the case. Um, Samuel Lasky uh, conducted services in Burke's Hall. Uh, Burke's Hall was at Southwest First and Morrison Street, and it was a loft above a stable and blacksmith shop. Uh, and Congregation Emmanuel in San Francisco loaned them their very first Torah and shofar so they could conduct services. And later, um, CBI did purchase those items from uh, Congregation Emmanuel. Uh, interesting side note, uh, at this time, Portland was all of 16 blocks big. Uh, all the houses were wood, all the other buildings were wood. There was the National Hotel, uh, there was a post office, five churches, uh, one school, and 55 saloons, because I mean, you can never have too many saloons, apparently. Um, and then, let's see, moving on. So here's sort of what this dirt road image looked like. This is not from the Congregation Beth Israel collection. We don't have any early photos um, from the collection at that time of, the, of a street view, um, but this is sort of gives you an idea of what Portland looked like at the time. Um, so then uh, in on September, so I, here's, this is a wedding invitation. This is from the collection. Everything I'm gonna show you from here on out is part of the congregation collection. So I won't continue to mention that. Um, I have transcribed it on the on the one side here because so it's a little hard to see on the screen. But so this is a wedding invitation. Um, uh, September 19th, uh, 1858, uh, Marjana Bettman, she was from San Francisco, and Simon Baum, he was an early immigrant to Portland. Um, they became Oregon's first Jewish couple to marry, and that ceremony was conducted um, at Congregation Beth Israel at Burks Hall up in that loft. Uh, and then moving on. So this is the very first official building that Congregation Beth Israel had. Uh, so this was... Um, this, this is a corner lot. It was at Southwest Fifth and Oak, and it was purchased in 1859 uh, for $750 at the time. 
Um, and the building was completed a couple of years later in 1861, and it was a total cost of about $4,500 at the time. So that's roughly $135,000 today. Uh, so it's a pretty hefty chunk of money. Um, it seated, it looks awfully small in this photo, but it seated roughly 200 people. And at the time, the or we have an article from the Oregonian, and they um, they call it uh, an or like quite an ornament of that part of the city. So it really, it really stood out at the time. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is, uh, we have three pieces here from the, from the collection. So, um, Moses Montefiore, uh, was, um, if you're not familiar, he was very famous at his time. Um, he married into the Rothschild family. He was very active on behalf of Jewish communities in Palestine and Russia, uh, among other countries. Um, he was a sheriff in London in 1837. He was knighted by Queen Victoria. He had a baronetcy, um, and that was uh, granted to him in recognition of his humanitarian efforts on behalf of Jewish communities around the world. Um, he was considered quite tall at his time. He was like 6'3". Uh, and he was very, very famous and very well respected, not only in London, but abroad. And so um, he, on his 100th birthday in 1884, many Jewish con uh, congregations and communities around the world celebrated that birthday. And you can see on the left, uh, we have a pamphlet. This is on uh, exhibit out in the, in the gallery. So when we're open again and you can come back, you can see this on exhibit out there in, in bigger form. Uh, so this is a notice. Uh, you can see Congregation Beth Israel's name there among a couple of other organizations who were essentially throwing a celebration party um, in honor of Moses turning 100. And in the center, this is um, a ledger. So this was the uh, recording of the births of all members of Congregation Beth Israel. Um, and uh, between 1885 and 1889, there are a number of children named Moses. And this page here, you can see um, the second name and the fourth name. There are two young boys being named Moses. And that was in honor of, of, of again, Moses's birthday. Um, and then on the far right, uh, that I did not transcribe for you, and I apologize, but I can send a transcript of this letter to anyone who would like it after the fact. Uh, so this is um, a letter that he wrote. Uh, he did not scribe it clearly. Um, you can see his signature at the bottom is very shaky. Uh, this letter was actually while he was just coming to the end of his hundredth year. So someone else wrote this letter for him, but it is sent to Beth Israel, probably many other congregations as well, um, thanking them for notes that he received and for celebrating his birthday. It's, it's, a, it's a real treasure that we have in the collection here. Um, let's see. So by the mid 1880s, uh, the congregation had grown pretty significantly. They they claimed a membership of about 150 men, um, and they wanted a bigger, uh, more beautiful, more substantial synagogue that they felt would really reflect their place in the community here in Portland. Um, so this is the second building here that was uh, constructed in, let's see, they finished it it took, they, they began construction in January of 1888. This was at the corner of Southwest 12th and Main Streets. Um, and I think it took a couple of years to construct and uh, something to keep in mind, this was built entirely of wood, uh, which is incredible. Uh, and it was one of the most decorative structures across the state of Oregon. Um, and those twin towers were visible from almost every quadrant of the city. And we have a few aerial photographs in the collection, which I did not include here. They're not part of the CBI collection, but you can see these towers in those aerial shots. You know, those are huge sprawling visuals and you can see these towers all over those photos, which is really astounding. Um, and at this synagogue, uh, you can see here, this is the invitation to the dedication. Uh, so this was in 1889, it actually took one year to, to complete, excuse me. Um, this was June, the dedication. So it was about a year and a half that this took to, to, to complete. Um, so this is the invitation to that dedication. And then here is the, this is the 25th anniversary of that dedication. We have a couple of these. These were pretty hefty. They're sort of pamphlet style, but they're, they're thicker than what we, we consider a pamphlet today. Um, the thing that I really love about these pieces is, uh, this is where we get a number of our photographs. Um, there's a, <clears throat> in the Golden Book, for example, is a photo of that second building that I just showed you a couple of slides ago. Um, and it's just such 
fantastic quality. And that's where we get a lot of these photographs. And it also shares with you, um, you know, they have this order of services and it, it will often tell you who's attending. Um, it might be the only record we have of who the officers were or who some early members were or who was serving as rabbi or cantor at the time. Uh, so these sorts of pieces in the collection are really fabulous. And we were lucky enough to have these for a couple of the different congregations in the collection as well, uh, in town as well. Alicia, can I interrupt you for a minute? Absolutely. Um, there's, um... I'm sure they were forward looking, but that's, I've always wondered, that synagogue was very large considering how many members, that they had 121 members, and I know it seated several hundred people. Any comments or? This one, um, it was about scale and grandeur. So what they really wanted to do was show that they were a very prestigious and wealthy congregation in town and in the, and, and in the Northwest period. Um, and they, this was, I think it was built with, with the idea that they would grow immensely uh, through the years. So that is why this synagogue is as large as it is. And quite frankly, um, I'll show you a photo in a few moments of the interior. Uh, I apologize. I don't actually have the numbers for how many this congregation seated. I'm sure I do have those someplace. I did not include them here. Um, it is those those pe the the towers. Excuse me. Are just for show. You know, you cannot. They they didn't. They're it, it's not in, enormous inside, but I do believe they built it with growth in mind. Yes. Uh, does that answer your question, Sally? Before I move on. Okay. Sorry. Just let me jump through these real quick. Um, so. The next uh, cool thing that I love in the collection is this marriage license. Um, so this is uh, the marriage license of Julius Meyer. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Julius was the youngest son of Aaron Meyer. Aaron Meyer was the founder of the department store Meyer and Frank. Um, and in 1901, Julius married Grace Mayer and they were the first native born Oregon Jews to marry and their ceremony took place at Congregation Beth Israel. Um, and Julius Meyer went on to become Oregon's um, first Jewish governor also. He served from 31 to 35. Um, so sadly, this temple was destroyed on December 29th, 1923. Some of you have probably seen some of these photographs. Um, so on the left here, you can see this is the interior, one of the interior images of that large temple. So you can see that it does seat a large number of people, but the, it, it, the outside is so much larger than what it seated inside. So again, I'll see if I can find those numbers and, and um, provide them to anybody who would like after this presentation. Um, so you, I wanted to show you this photo because you can see how beautiful the structure was inside and then what it looked like after the, after the fire, uh, which was just tragic. Um, so the, <clears throat> it was, it only, it took hours. I mean, it was, it was in no time at all that the community just rallied to support the congregation. So they, uh, many offers of assistance came in. There were churches who were offering to share space. Um, Lots and lots of donations came in immediately. Uh, the board thought they were going to go ahead and rebuild on that same site. Um, and then it actually, it was uh, early 1924. They actually bought the property that is that where, where the synagogue is now. So at 19th and Flanders, and they built again, an, another more enormous, more beautiful synagogue. At the time, their membership had, it wasn't, um, static, it was growing, it was not growing um, um, terribly fast, but again, they did build this new synagogue with growth in mind. Um, and at the time, the synagogue was constructed for roughly $410,000, which is equivalent to a little over $6 million today. It was a very uh, expensive project. Uh, it took all all in all, it took four years to construct. I'm not, I didn't show you a photo of the congregation because we're all so familiar with it at this point. Um, and the dedication took place over three days. So this is one of those dedication programs I was talking about. So here's this, the front cover here. Um, and then a couple of these internal pages. And again, it shows you, uh, it says order of services and it tells you who, uh, there are other pages of this program that give brief histories of the synagogue, uh, talk a little bit about the fire and why this had to be built. Um, it gives a list of some of the members of the time and again, officers and board members. And then it tells you who, was presiding over these services. And I think something that uh, doesn't happen as much today, probably when congregations are dedicated, I could be wrong, but um, at the time communities were so small that um, 
clergy from around the country would come and participate in these dedications. So if you can see, we have clergy listed from uh, San Francisco and Seattle and New York and uh, Los Angeles. So, so it was really a um, momentous occasion for Jewish communities across the country. And it's something that I love about these programs that we have within the collection. Um, so again, I know you're not here <laughs> just to hear about the history of the synagogue. Um, but like I said, I wanted to share some of that history with you uh, to uh, walk through some of these uh, items and sort of show you that we wouldn't know most of this if we didn't have this collection. Um, histories have been written. Well, I'm sure that there, you know, we've got a few books in the collection that give a rundown of, of these uh, dates that I've given you. But having the, the dedication programs and not just a note about it, you know, having the actual photographs and not just imagining, wow, what did this grand synagogue look like is really something. Um, so I'm gonna stop with the history there. Uh, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna ask real quick if there are any questions. I can't see everybody on the screen. So feel free to just speak up if you have any questions before I move on to, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about our collection and, and sort of what we do here. So I, I hear silence. I think I have no questions. Just gonna wait 10 more seconds, make sure that's correct. All right, I think we're all set. So, um, I'm gonna go ahead and let's see, let's just leave that. So um, many of you probably know, and I know several of you here on the screen have worked with us here in the archives. Um, so you're very familiar with this part of the talk probably. Archives essentially exist to preserve documents and records, uh, which ultimately preserves history. Uh, primary sources are invaluable uh, for researchers to learn about the past. Um, you know, these kinds of documents include uh, records of land transfers, correspondence, diaries, marriage certificates and birth certificates, travel documents, financial ledgers, um, and historians use all of this material to not only learn about the lives um, of historical figures and organizations and communities, but to retell those histories and, and you know, kind of make deductions. Um, it's been said that uh, every historical moment was capable of being understood if sufficient factual material was available in the archives. This is a little unrealistic. Um, if you work in an archives, you sort of know that that's true, but it does indeed represent the ideal that most archives, including us, strive for as, as we represent history and sort of preserve um, these documents. Um, and archives don't just exist to hold these documents. Uh, it's our job to make sure that all of this material is accessible. Uh, if it's not accessible, you know, I can have, you can see some of the stuff on the table behind me and you've seen what I've shown you here in the, um, in the PowerPoint, but if we don't create a record of it, if we don't organize it within the archives, it means nothing. You know, people can't see it. They can't make connections. They, they can't see a linear history of a person um, or an organization. So that's really the primary role that we have here is, is to organize the material and make it accessible for, for communities who would like to see it. Um, so you might be wondering what's in the collection. Um, so we, it's, uh, all archives are a little different. Um, ours here is, it's our, um, we document the history of the people in the institutions that make up the Jewish experience here in Oregon. Um, so these include the holdings of um, families, clubs, synagogues, uh, businesses, philanthropic organizations, other Jewish agencies. Uh, it is the largest collection of the documented and visual history um, of the Jewish people of Oregon. Um, and it encompasses a, a broad uh, format of, uh, a range of formats, excuse me. So books, um, journals, manuscripts, papers, records, photographs, maps, audiovisual material, um, cassette tapes and VHS and DVD and digital material. Um, and it is material dating from the mid, uh, even early mid 1800s to the present day. So as soon as something's created, we consider it historical record. Uh, so there, you know, I think a lot of folks have an idea that archives are only this old material, which is what I'm showing you here. Uh, but something created yesterday is, is, is part of that historical record. Uh, and so we do consider that part of our, of our collection as well. Um, our collection is non-circulating. You do have to make appointments to research or see any of this material. Much of what we have is scanned and digitized uh, so we can share it, which has been immensely helpful during COVID. We would not be able to function as well as we have been if we didn't have such a huge chunk of our collection digitized. Still working on that. We have a very large collection and there's a lot of work to do. Um, 
So we collect material, uh, it has to fit into our collecting policy. So it really needs to play a role in telling the story um, of the Jewish experience in Oregon. And that's regardless of when or where the connection to Oregon began. Um, so, um, you know, this, this includes uh, traditional pieces of ceremonial Judaica, artifacts of um, Oregon Jews service in the United States military, uh, materials pertaining to the experiences of Holocaust survivors and their lives before they arrived in Oregon, um, and any material that Oregon Jews brought with them on their journeys here. Um, so we don't, for example, what that means is if we have a family who was here and they got here in 1950, we don't only take everything that they created or produced after 1950, you know, anything that they give us that was that documented the first 20 or 30 years of their lives in any other state or states we, we accept as part of it, the collection. Again, it's, it's, it's their full historical record. So that's something we're very interested in here. Um, and then we also have uh, a three-dimensional collection. So this is our artifact collection. Um, it's a little hard to see, but you can see behind me, there are a couple three-dimensional objects I pulled out that are part of the Congregation Beth Israel collection. There's a Torah breastplate, um, a menorah, lots of other stuff in the collection that I'd be more than happy to show anybody. Um, I could maybe do a little tour uh, at some point or when we're allowed to be back in person, I'd gladly host any of you that would like to come through and see the archives. Um, so our three-dimensional objects include uh, again, Judaica, ceremonial objects, um, organ Jewish history objects. So those are, um, yeah, and it's not limited to, but, you know, coins and seals and medals, maps, blueprints, all kinds of stuff, you know, the, um, any material that a Jewish business created, the boxes that, that like Zell Brothers jewelry went home with people in, all of that's part of our collection as well. Um, and we have a, a pretty sizable research library at this point. So that's uh, books and clippings and documents that uh, are not part of our actual accessioned archival collection. So these sort of tell the uh, a history of the Jewish community here in Oregon um, and abroad. It, it's, it's material that relates to our community, but is not um, part of our community. I'm not sure I explained that very well, but um, we can go back to that. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna move forward just real quick uh, and um, just mention a couple of the other really cool objects that we have here part that are part of Beth Israel's collection now that I've sort of told you what we have. Um, this is the cemetery ledger. Uh, this is one of my favorite pieces in the collection. Uh, it is very large. Uh, it is right to my to my left there. Um, it's on a book stand. It's heavy. It probably weighs easily 15 pounds. <clears throat> and it's 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 very, you know, it's it's easily a foot and a half by two feet. It's it's a very big piece of piece of material. Um, so this the cemetery at Beth Israel was actually formed a few years after the congregation was. Uh, before that time, they used part of the cemetery at Lone Fir, uh, and they did exhume those graves, um, and they sent them across the river to a cemetery on Corbett before they um, located to their current day site. Uh, and the earliest record that we have in this uh, ledger is um, from 1847. Uh, that's the earliest burial record that we have. It's alphabetical. Um, it's in a rather good shape for as old as the book is and as, as, as often as it has been used. We do have all of these records digitized. Um, and there are records as, as late as uh, the early 2000s in this ledger. Uh, so it's, it's been, it, it has been used a lot. Um, and these are just some of the pages here. It's really a beautiful, beautiful letter, uh, ledger. Um, the, one of my other favorite pieces in the collection is this letter. <laughs> um, I did not block out her name because we've used this in exhibits. So, um, we know that she, she will not mind that I've used it here. This is one of my favorite letters. Um, I did not transcribe it, but again, I can, this is, uh, from 1976 and she was included in a, uh, bulletin with her husband and she was listed as Mr. and Mrs. Charles Rabinowitz. And she says, um, you know, while I have adopted my husband's last name, I have not adopted his first. And she's asking the congregation to change their policy of listing women as a Mrs. whatever their husband's name is. Um, and it did not happen immediately, but they did eventually make that change. Um, so that's one of my other favorite pieces. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and just give you a little update on the status of the collection here, the Congregation Beth Israel collection. So um, we got the collection in 2011. 
Um, so I know Gerald's on this call here. So Gerald was one of the, the members who was instrumental in helping us get this collection. So she worked with us at the time, the staff at the time for years, sort of organizing what was at Congregation Beth Israel before we decided to, to acquire it here, making sure everything that was fragile was housed appropriately. Um, and there was some record of what was there so that again, it could be accessible, usable material. Um, and uh, we did acquire that in 2011 and it was a lot of material bankers and bankers and bankers boxes worth of stuff. It was enormous. Um, so, you know, the early steps of, of a collection of uh, processing a collection like that is really a survey. We got to figure out what's in there, what we're going to do with it, create what we call um, a preliminary or tentative uh, arrangement or organization scheme. So, um, we have to think about what are administrative records, what are clergy records, what's related to clubs and organizations like sisterhood and brotherhood and create a, a hierarchical structure that we tentatively follow and hold to as we're going through the material. It's impossible to know everything that's there when you first get your hands and your eyes on it. And so that, that uh, arrangement does change shape as you move through. Um, and everyone here on the call who has worked on it can attest to that. Changes made pretty frequently um, and it's a, it's a lot of work, you know, you, you don't read every single word on every single piece of paper, but you've really got your eyes and hands on, on many, many, many documents through the course of a few hours work. Um, and you're always reading it with an eye towards, oh man, gosh, I, this isn't really administrative anymore. This is a whole different category and you start to move stuff around. Um, and this is, so we, the work began on this almost immediately. You can see the boxes behind me on the shelves with all the blue sticky notes and a couple of the others. Those are the last boxes that have been worked on. So up until the very last day before we had to close, Carol Chesler and Rose Rustin were here working on this collection. Gerald and Sue had been in about two weeks prior and so had Alice and Eve. Um, everybody was very sad that we had to close and everybody's had their hands on different parts of the material. Um, Rose and Carol have been working tirelessly on the administrative records and um, the committee records. That's probably the bulk of what we have in the congregation collection. Uh, and then uh, Sue and Gerald have been working on all of the stuff that it's probably been two, three, four years ago. Um, Josh found uh, found a lot of material in different rooms at this at the synagogue, and so that was brought over. Sue and Gerald have been working on getting that into a broad organization so that they can be integrated into the 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 parts of the collection that it needs to be. And even Alice actually started working on tangential material, which was um, we did acquire Rabbi Rose's a lot of his material when uh, just before he passed, and they were organizing. Um, we have, I think, just about every single eulogy that Rabbi Rose ever gave, and um, Eve and Alice were getting that in order, and all of that has just had to be put on hold. Um, we're very hopeful that they'll all come back and keep working on this. Um, it's not quite finished, like I said. It will be uh, as soon as they're done with all of their work. I'll go through it. Probably Anne and I. Anne's on this call too. Anne's our curator here at the museum. Um, and it might take another intern or two and we'll just get official labels on the boxes, make sure everything's, uh, Carol has done a lot of work typing up uh, what we call a finding aid. So that's the box and folder list. It's, it's, it is a, a very large amount of work. And so um, it's not quite done, like I said, but it's almost there and eventually will be accessible in all its glory. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there for the time being um, and open it up for questions, comments, um, I know I, I talk kind of fast and, I, and I've gone over a lot of material here, so it's also okay if you don't have questions, but whatever you'd like to, to say. Um, Alicia, mm -hmm. um, hi, this is Ellen Bick. I, I know that the museum ha has done a fabulous job on everything and also um, I've been um, very involved in sisterhood and also in keeping sisterhood records and we used a lot of the archives and and records and it was absolutely wonderful when we celebrated our 100th um, anniversary of being a sisterhood at uh, Beth Israel, which was about four years uh, in uh, 2017. So about three, four years ago. So uh, we we so much appreciate all those records. Thank you, Ellen. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Other questions or comments? Sally? So um, following up on Ellen's comments, um, can you just give us an idea of what kind of um, 
research requests you get for materials in the archive? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so specifically, I mean, we get requests of all kinds. Uh, the For Congregation Beth Israel, a large majority of the requests we get are um, death dates and birth dates uh, and also plot records. So someone might say, hey, I know that my parents own so-and-so plot in the cemetery and we know these family members are buried here. Can you tell us if anyone's actually buried in the other two plots and or if we own them still? It's fascinating. Um, and we actually use the ledger a lot for that rather than the online records that we have because we're lucky enough to have a very large contingent of volunteers who like to work with the original material. Um, and it's, it's, it's a great way to, to, it's also just easier to search. It's alphabetical and, it, and our database contains every single record for every single person who's ever been born or lived or died in Oregon. So it's, it's an easier way to search through it on, on, in that case. Um, we get a lot of uh, requests for um, records that might contain someone's Hebrew name. So if someone's getting married, if someone has passed and they, you know, the family members need their Hebrew name, we try to find it in the records, whether it's listed in membership records or any, like if they were B'nai uh, Mitzvah at the congregation over the years. And we go through and look at all of the bulletins that we've got. That's the best record we have of any of the B'nai Mitzvahs because they're all listed there. And that's true for most of the congregations as well. Um, we get a lot of requests for spe very specific information. So for example, I know when Rabbi Kahana was working on his sermons for the high holidays, um, he asked if we had anything in the collection uh, about the 1918 pandemic. So for that kind of information, we'll go to the meeting minutes, we'll go to the bulletins, we'll go to committee records, any correspondence from anyone we know who was a member at the, at the congregation at the time and look for dates and see what we can find. Uh, in that case, we happens to be unsuccessful. Um, um, so we get a lot of requests for very specific information. Absolutely. I think um, Anne had something to add. She was maybe raising, raising a hand. Um, you're, Anne, you're not to unmute. Sorry. Twice researchers have come doing um, biographies of Rabbi Stephen Weiss. Mm -hmm. And since we have the record of his time in the, in the collection, they were able to spend days with, with the files on Rabbi Stephen Weiss and other, other specific people like that um, have also been researched. I'm trying to think, Rabbi Jonah Weiss was too. Yeah, and Rabbi Berkowitz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alicia, do you have records? What other, what other congregations do you have records for? Mm -hmm. Uh, just about all of them in Portland. Uh, uh, so Ahavai Shalom and Neve Zedek and then Neve Shalom together, um, Ahavat Ahim, uh, Kesser, Haver. We have some records from Havara. Uh, some of the newer or younger congregations like Shir Tikva and even Pene Or, it's not as young, I know, but we don't have most of their records. <clears throat> and the <laughs> scope of those records really varies. Um, uh, it's because you know, record keeping was sometimes great and sometimes not. Um, it kind of depended on the size of the congregation and who was in charge of keeping those records and how those records were kept. Also, um, lots of congregations underwent, there, several synagogues were destroyed uh, during urban renewal and some of the material wasn't taken out of the synagogue. People didn't realize that it would be part of a historical record at some point, so it wasn't saved. Um, CBI is not the only congregation that had a fire. Ahavai Sholom did. And so there was a lot of material lost then. Neve Sholom had a flood, you know, so like a lot of material was lost from their archives at that time as well. Um, and what we have from Ahavai Sholom and Neve Zedek is anything that was kept when those two congregations merged to become Neve Sholom. So again, some of it's uh, detailed and some of it isn't. Um, we have more from Ahavai Sholom than we do from Neve Zedek, for example. What, what about um, any congregations in the rural areas of Oregon? Uh, we have some material from Temple Beth Israel and Eugene. Um, we don't have much from congregations outside of, of the larger towns. We have information about the communities, for example, like in Baker, Oregon, um, Southern Oregon, 
uh, but they most of what we have some oral histories from from folks in those communities as well. And you'll hear most of them say that they actually held membership at synagogues like Neve Shalom and Beth Israel because they traveled here for any major events, holidays, all of that. So um, not a lot of congregations in the smaller rural areas of Oregon. <clears throat> Great question. Rabbi? <laughs> curious about the move then to digital like I'm looking at this and I haven't spent any time in the archives so that was fascinating to me in the beginning um it also makes me feel incredibly guilty because I don't I don't think I keep any record I mean oh goodness so um and I know we've talked about this but you know how how do you collect records now when everything is online you know it's like do we you know you turn over I don't have anything handwritten. I mean, I have like, you know, notes of conversations. I have to-do lists that I can hand over, you know, that are handwritten, but but probably most people don't even have that, right? We do everything electronically. We don't have the handwriting. We don't have the record keeping. Like, I'm just thinking, what do you, how, how do you do this now? And how do you help us what to leave something it? for, you know, a hundred years from now that people can look back on? What yeah, there was. <laughs> so um, digital collection is is not it's not new to us, but it is still in its infancy in the scheme of things. Um, so in terms of acquiring anything digital, we're you know <clears throat> we have a lot of work ahead of us when we get material to make sure that it's in uh, convertible formats that are going to migrate as machines and operating systems migrate. But what we like to take from folks are uh, all of their files in whatever form they take on a flash drive or a hard drive. Um, so your photographs, um, you know, any of the sermons you were to write or any of the, any talk you were to give, any of the lectures you were to give, anything that's digital, you know, you drop it on a, on a flash drive and send it over. And we, it's, I can, um, I can actually share my screen and show you guys a little bit in a moment of like kind of what our server looks like. So, uh, it's organized digitally the exact same way it would be organized physically. So in a box, you know, folder one moves through folder 20 and they've all got labels. Uh, it tells you what series it is, what's in the folder, all of that jazz. And we do the exact same thing digitally. So folders and items are listed identically. Um, and the actual digital asset, whether it's a photograph, a Word document, an audio file, uh, we make sure that it's in uh, archival format. So waves for audio files, um, MP4s or MOVs for, for, uh, for visual files. Um, Word docs work just fine. We make sure that they're all, you know, going, like I said, going to migrate with us for the next hundred years. And then they just live on a digital server. Um, the tricky thing about collecting digitally, really, like you said, Rabbi Joseph, is that um, everything feels, it moves very fast. Everything's pretty transient. People keep stuff and get rid of stuff in a way that they never did with physical material. The reason that we have a huge amount of what we have is because people were going to get rid of it. They wanted to throw it away, shred it, burn it, whatever it was. And they fortunately thought of us <laughs> and we've convinced enough people over time to think of us before they think of, of someplace else. Um, and that physical material is just, it's its right there at your fingertips. It's like I said, it's just, you don't just get rid of one photograph. You know, all of your photographs are in a box. Digitally, you go through and you take 10 photographs. You're like, oh, I only need one to, rec to, you know, commemorate this day at the beach. And so you get rid of everything else. Um, and that's okay. We just have one photo of Rabbi Joseph and her family at the beach. That's great. Um, it's just a matter of... <sighs> it's harder for people to, we have to depend on, and, and we you know, are working on educational material to this effect to help people sort of collect that material themselves, uh, themselves digitally. So if it's on your phone, you know, when you are thinking about deleting photos or cleaning them out, you know, put them in a folder on your desktop uh, or a computer or Kindle, Word, whatever you have, and keep your photograph that way. And it's, it is not as easy as it is with physical material. Like I said, we're really still working on that. And something that we haven't uh, mastered just yet are calendars digitally. So what I would love, uh, you know, so <laughs> yeah, so I bet you have the any B'nai Mitzvah you do, weddings, baby names, all that's probably might be on a calendar. It's just a Google calendar or an Apple calendar. So getting that information to us is, is tricky. Um, we still really love it <laughs> if people have that calendar and then they keep a, a physical record. And that's just not that realistic these days. So this is something that, like I said, it's not new to us, but it really is still in its infancy. And we have a lot of work ahead of us to, um, 
to really enter into the primarily digital collecting era. It's, it's a tough road. Alicia, I have a question. Uh, first of all, this has been terrific talk. Uh, I learned so much. I'm new to Portland, so it's especially interesting for me. I was wondering, you mentioned a few congregations that you don't have any material from. Do you actively kind of recruit and, and educate? I assume that you're aware which ones haven't been providing material. So that's a part we, of the project. We are, and we do, yes. So um, part of, <clears throat> like when we're talking about digital material, so especially some of the younger congregations, um, may never have sent out physical bulletins um, like we get from some of the congregations now. And, you know, they've changed over the years also. They maybe used to be weekly and now they're monthly or quarterly even, just depends on what, what kind of information they're sharing with their congregation. Um, so we've spent more time with organizations and congregations explaining how best to get us their material digitally and how to save it and move it to us. So fortunately, Organizations are easier than individuals and families because it, they're working files. So they have all of their past bulletins, at least for several years, if not more, uh, on a server or on a, on a desktop or someplace already. So we have them, you know, we ask that they migrate that to us on a monthly, yearly, or even, you know, every five years basis. Um, it, it makes it easier. Someone's not always responsible for checking that something got sent to us every month. And it makes it easier for us to organize everything uh, in, in sort of uh, en masse in, the, in that sort of function. Um, so we are very aware of the synagogues and congregations and businesses and organizations and families that we have little material from that we want more. Uh, and so it is, it is a never ending effort that we reach out to them. We, we do these sorts of uh, presentations. We go to the congregations or the businesses. You know, We talk to people who we know are members and just kind of keep ourselves in the conversation as best we can. Uh, just to remind them, hey, we're, we are here when you're ready. We're here to help with education. We're here to help with, um, you know, we'll go through all of the records for you or with you. We'll help you organize it on site before you want to transfer it to us. It's in our interest to, to work with anyone where they're at. You know, so um, we don't come in with an eye just to getting it all here. We want to make sure that that it's a comfortable process for everybody. So sometimes like Gerald did with the with these records is organizing it on site first and making sure that everybody knows what's there and everybody has a has an opinion or a vested, uh, uh, you know, they're invested in it coming here, uh, that there's a good reason for it, so. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that occurred to me is because we've all been on Zoom for a year now, and this is a historical year, and you mentioned you don't have too much from 1918, uh, it would be great to take some of the recorded Zoom meetings or lectures like this and keep them as part of the archive as well. Absolutely. So I know um, I've had a few notes from staff at Congregation Beth Israel specifically. I think that almost every recording they're making is being kept and will be transferred to us, which is fantastic. We don't have that from every other synagogue, but there are things that they are recording and making sure that we're going to get. We did get recordings of high holidays from a few of, this, of the congregations. Um, and we, that's going to be invaluable. And we actually have, it's really, uh, we, there's tons and tons of information out there about the 1918 pandemic, uh, just not here, uh, it, unfortunately. And so we have, uh, I'm going to say this to everybody, it's a little plug for our other project. We have a um, pandemic where we're collecting stories about the Jewish experience during the pandemic. So several of you on this have already been interviewed for that. Um, and anyone else who's interested, please feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, uh, directly or through anybody that you know, I'd love to capture your story. Rabbi Joseph has been interviewed, Sally has, Alice Meyer, um, anyone else who would like to be interviewed, please uh, reach out. We ask questions about what it's been like to live through this pandemic so that we here in Portland and for our Jewish community have a record of what it's been like so we don't have the same, same thing that happened in 1918. Anything else? Uh, Ian, it looks like your hand is up. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, was it ever resolved what caused that fire in 1923? It was not what we, well, I, uh, gosh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm blanking a little bit. We know it was not arson, if I'm not mistaken, um, or it was not, excuse me, it was arson, but it wasn't anti-Semitic. Um, that's, so it was intentionally huh. set, um, but there was no connection to to anti-Semitism, so that was. I believe it was a disgruntled past employee. That's really? right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else? So um, Ms. I'd like to just um, maybe see if any of the, um, I guess they're all women, women who worked on the archive have anything they want to add, any special, you know, things that stick out in their minds of materials that were surprising or their favorites. And I'm going to call, if you don't want to say anything, that's fine. But Gerald, I'm going to put you on first. <laughs> Gerald did, did a wonderful piece for the OJM CHE um, gala this past weekend, which is the recording is still available of that, of that gala. Um, so. Oh, we thanks. Can hear you. Yeah, we can ah. hear you, Gerald. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear me. Can. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, well, um, there was nothing, you know, specific. It was absolutely fascinating to find out that something had been saved but not cataloged and put in an archive state. I think the Oregon Jewish Museum has done a fabulous job. I'm so grateful to Alicia and Judy and Anne particularly. I just wondered, uh, Sally uh, or uh, staff, if there was any connection with some of the records that you have that you've that you've gotten through the Oregon Historical Society, because that goes back innumerable years too. Uh, Alicia, do you know if there was anything that was, are you in touch with the Oregon Historical Society? Because some people who may not even be a member of a congregation in Portland, if they perhaps have sent things over there, are you in collaboration with them? We are in conversation. So um, it is it is a policy that most archives hold is that if you receive material that is not relevant to your collection and would be better housed um, and better represented by a different institution, you move it. Um, and that is 99% true with, with um, the Oregon Historical Society. There is some material that they have uh, that um, is equally as relevant to them and it is not here so that you know we we do try to to inform folks if they're here researching a person or an organization that they may also find additional information at OHS the city archives are the same so any um, Jewish uh, government official city or or state level um, their records may also be at the state archives or at the Portland City Archives here Neil Goldschmidt is an example um, and you know he was he he had a very long tenure in city government. So his records really do belong there and not here. Of course, we have some photographs of him in the collection, um, but it is better housed there, even though he also is Jewish. So we do try to um, make sure that the material lives where it really should. And then we we all know what's where uh, to the best of our ability and, and direct people appropriately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carol, did you wanna make any comments? So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I specialize in Beth Israel committees. So that's my claim to fame. <laughs> and committee, committees are a very essential part of how Beth Israel operates. And that's how uh, I think most of the volunteers at Beth Israel um, do their work. Committee structure is, is almost endless. And um, at times I have to say, I mean, the com some of our records of committees go back well into the 1920s and 1930s and certainly 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. 2000, so that's about as far as we've gotten, but it is, um, the records were very well kept. I mean, the, the folders were kept, but there were duplicates and more duplicates. And uh, sometimes it felt like 
all we were doing was sorting through committees and then finding out we already had the same minutes or the same lists or the same whatever. But it's a very tedious process, but eventually we got through it and which was like, yay, we did this, my goodness. And um, when we, when my group, Rose Rustin, Sharon Tarlow, uh, Shirley, uh, not as recently, but often, and Evelyn Nasals and Rosalie Goodman, we just have a lot of fun. I mean, because it's social and we can, when we get something really interesting, we share it with each other. And so it's, it's really a fun process, especially when you do it with people that uh, you enjoy and um, laugh with. And Alicia and Anne and have just been remarkable. They are so available to help us with, we have endless questions and decisions, little teeny decisions, but help in the organization. And sometimes should we file it this way or should we file it in this kind of a, a category? This is, uh, is always of concern because anybody that works in an office goes through this. Where should this be filed under? It's very subjective. So we've tried to come, we've tried to come to um, a meeting of our minds so that we're consistent. But of course, it's not, it's never perfect, but we've come a long way and we've learned so much from Alicia and from Anne and Judy and all, all the others. That's all I've got to say. Carol. Thanks, Carol. Eve? Um, it's raising questions for me as to what is in the collection. I was wondering, um, in if in Rabbi Rose's file that have um, uh, made available to the archives, um, it was in the late seventies, I believe, when after some considerable thought, he decided that he would be willing to marry um, Jewish persons and non-Jewish persons, and what those conditions might be. And I was just curious in his in his material, if anything has come up. Anne has her hand up. <laughs> we have um, wonderful audio of, of, Rabbi Ro of a, an oral history interview that Rabbi Rose did many years ago, where he talks about that at length. He talks about the decision that he made and why he at first didn't marry um, interfaith couples and then why he changed his mind. So yeah, we have that and it's, it's transcribed and um, really interesting. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, and I think it's been made pretty clear. This, none of this is possible without our volunteers and, and the few interns that we work with every year as well. Um, there's too much material. Uh, it's, it's an enormous undertaking, every single collection we get. Um, and we couldn't do it without the people who are willing to sit and work with us all the time. Um, and it's as much a joy, I think I can speak for Anne as well, for us when social hour is happening. It's really nice to get to see, we, you know, we become very friendly um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really special for us on our end as well. I wanted to just share one um, piece that I know of that was in the archive and Judy had mentioned it in a presentation that she, or in a, a, a talk that she did during a Shabbat service, uh, veterans, uh, day weekend a few years ago. Um, so my, my dad and my uncle were raised at Beth Israel and they were both fighting in World War II and my uncle was in the South Pacific and he was injured and was in a um, hospital um, and was fairly bad shape and the family had really not received much um, of an update on how he was doing. 
And it turned out that Rabbi Berkowitz, who was the rabbi at Beth Israel at the time, was a military um, chaplain and was um, assigned to the hospital just by chance where my uncle was being treated. And Rabbi Berkowitz was able to get a letter to my grandparents to tell them that he had seen Eddie and that Eddie was doing mm. okay and everything was going to be all right. And that's the kind of, you know, document that exists in the archive. Mm -hmm. We have when wonderful photographs too of, of Rabbi Berkowitz serving in the, in the military and in services. And yeah, it's, it's really nice. Yeah. <clears throat> so other any questions? other comments? Rabbi Cantor, I don't know if Cantor's still. Yes, yeah, she's here. <clears throat> this was amazing. I just, I, I apologize privately that I had to jump in and out because of other things pulling, but um, I'm just looking forward to, to learning more and finding other ways that we can help support the museum in all of these efforts. I was thinking about once we can gather again, just having opportunities to maybe send B'nai Mitzvah kids there to do some projects or I, I don't know, just to, to get a next generation interested too in this history, this ongoing, so, so incredible, our history. So thank you, Alicia, for all you did absolutely. or doing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I just wanna echo the thank, and I'm just echoing this, the thanks. And like I said before, I have learned so much and I realized, you know, really, we should all spend a lot more time at the archives <laughs> and it gives me such a sense of pride to sit here, you know, with all of you and really feel part of that Shoshala Kabbalah, that chain of tradition, you know, going back and is, is really so powerful. And so thank you all for working on this. I mean, I've seen, I remember the boxes going out and I heard the stories and see if we go through them. Um, but, and I've, I've toured, I've, I've seen the rooms of the archives at the museum. And I know we did that with our board once several years ago. And, but yeah, I totally agree with Cantor to figure out how ways of integrating and just, it's also just really interesting for all of us. I mean, right, like everything should go to the archives, not just as the synagogue, but as individuals living Jewish lives in Oregon. Um, and it, it's just not you know, on my radar <laughs> when it should be. And so this is also just so helpful because you're like, yes, because it's going to be so fascinating in a hundred years for people to look back on all of this and go, what? <laughs> that was crazy. So, <laughs> so thank you. And thank you just for putting the presentation together, taking the time um, to do this and sort of in our little thing of a thank you to Sally and Anita and Rita and Rosie was on for, which is sort of a group that have come together to try and lift up members of our community and the gifts that they can bring. Um, so I really appreciate that as well. Thank you. And now Leslie you, is good. Alicia. So we will look forward. Um... Leslie, Leslie has her hand oh, up Leslie. quickly. Um, I, Alicia, I have, um, I have a question that's not really about Beth Israel, but I was wondering whether the archives have any information on the formation of the Jewish cemetery at Riverview. Uh, I don't think we do actually. We have some information about the formation of a couple cemeteries, but I don't think we do about that one. Uh -uh. I'm sorry. Um, maybe you and I can catch up because my late husband was one of the people who helped put that together. Fabulous. I, yes, I would appreciate that. Um, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. I think I have your email actually to Leslie, so I can email you. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and especially thank you to you, Alicia. This was great. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you and your wife, Jacqueline, at services and all of us being together, hopefully, and other synagogue activities soon. Yes. Um, and um, if there's no other comments, I think we're, we're all good to go. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Yeah, this is Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. We'll be in touch. You got it, Eve.
<laughs> when, do, when can the volunteers come back? <laughs> we're aiming for June. Honestly, we're aiming for June. All the volunteers who want to come back, please get in touch. I, mean, with I would assume all the volunteers are the ones who are vaccinated. So <laughs> yeah. they can come back without you. <laughs> exactly. They don't need me at all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. Part, party, in, party in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, in the museum yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Lisa, question not not con not uh, about archives but you could tell us is the gift shop uh for passover oh, open no. now yep they are open today through friday so if anybody just wants this to come week? Down, they're just this week i believe yeah i think it's 11 to 3 we're open today through, yeah today through friday yep thank you absolutely yeah and i'm here if anybody comes down i'll be here thursday too to run the gift shop yeah <laughs> you know all, yeah we all do everything no yeah yeah that's great that's yeah. really funny yeah. a woman for all seasons <laughs> i try um, i don't think we're not doing a passover gift shop are we i wonder uh hmm. great question no one ellen bick's gone i don't know there's like no one from i don't know i don't know i know they did a pop-up on hanukkah i haven't thought about passover like possible the stuff from when we closed down is still there which well that was, was so crazy right it's like the 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 miniature what do we call it the one that was like in the, the office the pop-up yeah, the pop-up sisterhood gift shop was it's still passover it's so like i still like every right every day we're in the office and there's like the seder plate has still been there since march of 2020 uh, so I was wondering if anybody's, anybody's called and asked if you have a seder plate we do we do have some seder plates <laughs> but that's true i know huh? interesting yeah all of ours is left over from last year too because we all shut down yeah we haven't ordered anything new or anything it's all just what was already there yeah so that makes sense like we had to order more hanukkah stuff because we did hanukkah but you're right the passover is just the passover yep hmm. well, i have to jump off i'm gonna make yeah. rabbi joseph host um I think we can we can say goodbye it's yeah. like oneg you know like Sorry. the last to go is the last to go okay. Okay. Hi, thanks. thank you very much bye. Bye. thanks bye. <laughs>